Welcome, friends. I spoke to you in the morning about uh, the preparation for the spiritual path. I would now like to tell you that the, what are the steps that we really take to achieve the highest possible realization that mystics have spoken about. It's all right to be a seeker. We are seekers, and we are accosted by so many masters, and we don't know which one to follow. So I suggested in the morning that we follow any master that pulls us. Wherever we feel the pull, we go, and then we make as much progress as we can. And if we are still not satisfied, we wait and keep on seeking, and we'll find the perfect living master. Indeed, the perfect living master will find us. What does he do then? The perfect living master shows himself to the disciple in several ways by small experiences. He gives you an experience which makes you feel there is something going on here. You don't know how far he is there or how far you can go, but there is small miraculous experiences that you have. When he considers you are ready and you ask for initiation or nam as we call it in India, then he accepts you and once he accepts you, initiates you, he takes full responsibility from that moment to make sure that you will go back to your own home in the true home in Sajkant. He gives a guarantee that now he is responsible. Your seeking has actually ended there. Though we still keep on feeling, still we see something, still we go ahead and have experiences, we are still seeking. But the truth is, if a perfect living master initiates us, the seeking has ended. And he has taken full responsibility to make sure that we go ahead. After that, all our job is to follow his instructions on our lifestyle, which is very simple. He will say, be a vegetarian, don't take drugs, don't drink alcohol, um, lead a very simple, good moral life, and uh, meditate regularly. Spend one-tenth of your time on meditation out of 24 hours. At least devote two and a half hours to meditation, regular meditation. You can do it in one spell or you can do it in more, depending on your job situation, depending on your lifestyle. And he will then help you to adjust to the new program of meditation, which will take you step by step to ultimate realization that your home was not here, but was in the highest region of pure totality of consciousness. In the process, after initiation, he will take you to a point through what will look like your effort, like your effort, your hard work, He'll take you to a point where you will see him in meditation. You'll see the same form of the human form of the master in meditation, which will be a radiant form. Radiant in the sense you can see that form in utter darkness too. And that radiant form of the master then becomes your constant companion. It takes some time to reach the radiant form. According to Great Master, our job is to go to the airport and there the Master is waiting with two tickets to fly us back. <laughs> and, but we go alone, or it looks like we are going alone, only up to the airport. After that, we never travel alone on the spiritual path. We are always having the company of the Master. In the beginning, it looks like the Master appears and then disappears, or he appears at a distance and then he disappears. Actually, the master does not appear or disappear. It's our attention that is not yet focused completely on the radiant form of the master. Once that happens, you're never alone. You're never lonely. And all the rest of the journey of a, with a, a, as an initiate of a perfect living master is always in the company of the master, never alone. It's a very beautiful experience to always have somebody as your friend. The master inside talks to you, cracks jokes with you, 
flies with you. He's a friend. He's so much of a friend. He's a better friend than any friend you would find in the world. That is true friendship. And his love, like his love from outside, is unconditional. He does not judge you. A perfect living master never judges a disciple. Because if he started judging us, we would all fail. Therefore, it's lucky that he doesn't judge us. <laughs> he is always forgiving. Once upon a time, great master was sitting, reading his mail, and his secretaries were around him. And I was a young disciple of his. I was doing fan seva. Fan, because there was no electric power there, and it was a little hot in the dera. We had a big fan. The fan was about my size, but I loved that seva, that service with the fan. That means I would then blow the fan to just ventilate. And I was doing the fan seva when a man came running and said, Master, forgive me. Master, forgive me. I did not follow your instructions. You told me not to drink alcohol Last night, I went in a party and drank all evening. You told me not to eat meat, and I ate all kinds of steaks and whatever there was in the party last night. You told me not to indulge in other evil things. I did everything evil last night in the party. Forgive me. Great Master looked at him and said, Okay, don't do it again. He said, Thank you very much, thank you, and he ran away. And the secretaries were surprised. They said, Master, the man did everything wrong. And you just forgave him? What if he doesn't listen to what you said and he does the same thing again and comes to you and says, forgive me. Will you forgive him again? The great Master said, yes, I'll forgive him again. Master, when will you punish him? The great Master said, there are too many people punishing him. His own mind is punishing him. Don't make me one of the punishers at all. Let me be a forgiver at all times. That's the kind of forgiveness of a perfect living master. He never judges. He knows that we are trapped by our own mind into temptations. We are trapped by our own mind into doing things that we don't want to do. And we regret it. Our conscience hurts us. We punish ourselves. Masters don't come to punish us. There's too much negativity around us to punish us. The world is full of negative forces around who punish us anyway. Perfect living masters don't come to punish, they come to forgive. Always. That's a big characteristic of a perfect living master. They do not judge. So you will have this experience with a master who does not judge, either in his external form as a human being or in his internal form as a friend who is in the radiant form of the master. The journey starts from there and stage by stage he'll take you back. On the way there are many stages which you pass through. The astral stage itself is a very beautiful place. It's a, another world. It's a world from where all the ideas that are picked up for this world have been developed. This world, physical world, is merely a gross copy of what exists in the astral plane. Everything that you see here in this world is also there. The furniture is there, the halls are there, the libraries are there, scientific labs are there, people are working there, and they are doing all kinds of things which they are doing here, but with much greater facility. They can fly. There's no gravity there in the astral plane. Nobody worries about weight or weight loss in the astral plane <laughs> because there's no gravity. You can reach the astral plane, which is the first level of consciousness, of wakefulness. You can reach that plane and then you can find that you have so many things which you wanted to do 
in the physical world, which you could not do, and you can do it there. You will find many people whom you knew, the mathematicians, scientists, others, pursuing their activities in the astral plane. The little difference is there. If you visit the library of an astral plane and are interested in a particular subject, say you are a medical person and want to study medicine, you go and open up a book. In this library, you open a book, you have to read it. There you open a book, it opens up the knowledge straight away to you without reading it. And yet there are books. There's so much similarity. Uh, and yet there is such a big difference. You can see things. The biggest change you will notice will be in the experience of time. Here, time flows only in one direction. And we know time is just going through a timeless now. And what has passed is past. What is still to come is future. And what is just happening in the timeless present, in the timeless now, is the only time we know here. You cannot freeze any moment. It just moves on. There is no way we can stop. In the astral plane, you can stop it. Stop at any place. And view that particular episode, that scene, for as long as you like. There are many great features. I could spend the whole day talking to you about life on the astral plane. But it's very beautiful, it's different. But you can know what you're going to do because you can watch time. You can also see what's coming. So you gain a lot, but you lose something. What do you lose? You lose your feeling of free will because you can see what you're going to do anyway. <laughs> Therefore, the free will disappears. Free will is only in the physical human state because here we have free will because of ignorance. There you have knowledge, so free will disappears. Otherwise, it's beautiful. Many souls stay there for a long period, enjoying the great beauty. All the heavens and hells that have been spoken of are existing in the astral plane. And you can visit them. They are beautiful places which are called heavens. You enjoy them. They are hells also. And there is a lower part they call the sub-astral plane. But they all exist there. And you can see what's going on there. You like to think that that is such cunt. You like to think that is the end of the journey. Most people cannot believe that there is anything more, that can be anything more. But the master keeps on advising you, this is not it. You have to move on. And depending on how much your distractions are at the astral plane, you move on to the next level, which is the causal plane. The causal plane is very different. In the astral plane, the form, our form, is like the human form. It looks the same, except that we can change our form into a younger person, into an older person, into a person that we have been in a past life. But we go there with the same form in which we just enter from here. But later on we can change. And we can see the changes in the forms taking place. But in the causal form, there's no form. It's a sort of a... We are just... Lights, it's not even light. We are concepts. If I can explain that we are concepts. It is difficult for me to tell you that if you say that a person in the causal plane is color purple, and purple is a color, but color has become purple only here in the physical plane. It's an idea of a purple color, which is a much wider idea in the astral plane, and purple is a living being in the causal plane. You take of a shape, a triangle. A triangle is just a form with three and in the physical plane, the triangle is all triangles, big and small, different shapes in the astral plane. One triangle represents all of them. And in the causal plane, a triangle is a walking entity and a flying entity with a soul in it. So the amazing thing is that all the shapes and forms and concepts that have ever come to create the lower two regions of experience come from the causal plane. 
it is the cause of all experiences in the three worlds. And that can be experienced through the help of a perfect living master. And yet, all these three regions I've spoken of are dependent on the mind and exist in time and space. In this physical world, time flows in one direction at a single space. Same time, we go by the watches and the clocks. In the astral plane, time can be halted and pause can be experienced. In the causal plane, we can travel on time both ways, into the past and to the future. I must tell you that there is a little misunderstanding about the time even here in the physical plane. Let us see, what, what is time for us? In our experience, time has three sections, three parts. Past, present, and future. The past is what has already happened, and we have no access to it, it's already gone. The present has no time. Because before I can say the word present, it was future. When I said it, it became past. The present we are thinking of as a part of time is actually no part of time at all. Now has no time. Now, when we use it in a general sense, we are talking of immediate past and we call it now. What just happened in the last few minutes, I say, I'm doing it the present. Otherwise, time never stops at now. Now is totally timeless. So what we call present is actually immediate past. So past is past, present is past. What about future? Do you know if three words were struck off from the dictionary, hope, fear, anticipation, suppose these three verbs are not there, there is no future. Future is being created by our hoping, by our fearing, by our anticipating. All three are anticipations. Hope is positive, fear is negative, and anticipation is neutral. But they're all anticipation of what could happen, what we wanted to happen, what we wish would happen, and we create a future. But there is no way we can hope without using time. There is no way we can anticipate without using time. There is no way we can fear without using time. When we use time, they go into the past. Look at it carefully. What we think is three segments of time is only one, past. Past is past, present is past, future is past. There is no future and there is no now or present. They are all past. Now the big difficulty is that we can never live in the past. We can only live in the now. Then how are we living? How are we having experience in time? The only way to access the past is through memory. There's no other way. If you want to live the past or remember the past, the only function in consciousness you have is your memory. Does it make sense if you think over it that what we are going through and what we think is a life we are leading is just a recall of memory lived once again? That's what it is. If it is all memory that we are going through, the memory means something has happened at some point, then only you can recall. Where did it happen? It can't happen here because there is no time. So then you will notice that the way we experience life here is being generated somewhere else in the astral plane where time can be halted and events can be put into it. So it's a very interesting feature. Same thing in causal plane, you can go forward and backwards and then you realize that there is no difference between time and space. That like space... All things are placed at once, and then you go from place to place. In time, all events are placed in, at once, and you go from one point to another. So that's how we are experiencing our life. The, it is uh, it's easier to experience it than to explain it. <laughs> easier to go and see what's going on. In this world, in the astral plane, and even in the physical plane, there are many other universes existing. This planet is just one of the planets which we have not been able to figure out how we came on this planet, how it cooled down and solidified and the water was broken up by the volcanic action and we found land and we are all sitting here. 
It's a very interesting geological event that took place. But there are many planets or planet-like structures in this universe where there is life and souls like the soul that inhabit this planet also inhabit those planets. And the rules of nature there are quite different from the rules of nature here. In meditation, even just having reached the astral plane, you can visit many of those other areas. You can visit many galaxies of the physical plane and see where those planets are situated. So it's a very vast, vast creation. It is so vast, it's beyond our imagination. And yet, through meditation, with the help of a perfect living master, you have access to all of that as an experience. As I said, this is all meant for experience. And we get more and more experiences as our awareness widens and we are able to go to these higher levels. These are all three worlds of the mind. The mind has created them, the mind makes us live through them, the mind enjoys them, and the soul is tied up with the mind and also suffers or enjoys, depending on whether the mind is suffering or enjoying. True bliss and happiness, unalloyed, with no opposite of it, only exist above that in Parbrahm and Sachkhand areas beyond the realm of the mind. Very few masters have ever come or will come or exist today who have transcended the mind and gone into those regions. We call them perfect living masters. The masters who are still taking us to these three levels are great masters, of course, they are doing a great job, but they are not taking us out of the wheel of reincarnation. They may take us to a stage where we can be there for millions of years, but we are again born again and we come into the cycle again. The only way when you can be really out of this wheel of reincarnation and going round and round is to go beyond the mind. The perfect living master then takes you to realms beyond the mind. And there, from there, the individuated soul is able to experience itself and know that it was a soul, not the mind. It was a soul that had just attached itself to the mind so much that it thought it was the mind. You realize that. In that area we call Par Brahm. Brahm means the creative power and Par Brahm is beyond that, beyond the creation of these three worlds. The perfect living master takes you there and you can then see that the soul itself is a very illuminated entity compared to the light that we see here. This one solar system here contains the light of one sun sitting here and that sun is able to light up the whole earth, whole system, solar system, create eclipses, create, uh, shed its uh, great light all over in large spaces. And each soul in the Parbrahm has the light of 16 of these solar suns. That's our reality. That's the light that we possess and is sitting inside this body of ours. If we find out who we are, we have so much light in ourselves. This is not merely the light of knowledge. To be enlightened can be that you have the light of knowledge. This is physical light also, the light as we know it. It's a very remarkable experience to see that the light that we can't even face one sun with these eyes. And there, our own light is equivalent to 16 of these suns put together. Is the light of one soul. And yet... That itself is a cover upon the self. It's the cover of individuation, the cover of feeling we are one soul. And there are many souls. We still feel there are many souls, we are just one soul. That is the cover. After that, there is no way anybody can ever transcend beyond that. Even with the masters, there is a lot of argument. And many masters are stuck there. And we call them sadhgurus in India, as against satgurus. The sadhguru is one who has reached that stage of the soul being alone in your reality. And satguru is the one who then goes beyond to such hunt or to the true home, where we find we are not one individuated soul, but we are an experience of one within one total soul. That the, our reality is just one totality 
of consciousness and that's what who we are and we have become individuated as a first step we got the mind in the second step we got senses in the third step we got a physical body the fourth step and we are caught up here and we think we are the outermost cover there are many ways to go through these regions but the one preferred by the perfect living masters throughout history and certainly by the great master who initiated me is called the method of surt shabd yoga that means the method of the attention and the sound that you can link your attention to an inner sound inner resonance the resonance is not really a sound it's the creative power there is no word to describe the creative power that created even the creator people have asked me well god made everything who made god a good question well uh, all the scriptures have answered that in a way the rig veda in india out of the four vedas the ancient scriptures says in the beginning was a sound nad it calls the beginning was a sound and the sound created the creator and creator created this and the sound and the creator were one in john's gospel in the bible the opening verses are in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god same it's a translation or and we have become individuated as a first step we got the mind in the second step we got senses in the third step we got a physical body the fourth step and we are caught up here and we think we are the outermost cover there are many ways to go through these regions but the one preferred by the perfect living masters throughout history and certainly by the great master who initiated me is called the method of surt shabd yoga that means the method of the attention and the sound that you can link your attention to an inner sound inner resonance the resonance is not really a sound it's the creative power there is no word to describe the creative power that created even the creator people have asked me well god made everything who made god a good question well uh, all the scriptures have answered that in a way the rig veda in india out of the four vedas the ancient scriptures says in the beginning was a sound nad it calls the beginning was a sound and the sound created the creator and creator created this and the sound and the creator were one in john's gospel in the bible the opening verses are in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god same it's a translation from the veda is the same statement everywhere else you will find the description is that because we cannot describe that power for lack of a word we are using the word word that's the truth that there is no word to describe it so what can we call it but why call it word why not call it x the reason for that is that when that creative power descends from region to region from level to level and comes to the physical level it is audible can be heard so therefore it's good to call it music music of the spheres the uh, sound current the word anything that can, that is audible so all the languages have tried to use some expression to show that it is audible can be heard since it is a connection between all levels it is also a description of consciousness itself it is the resonance of consciousness if if that makes any sense that if we, there is nothing to be conscious of would consciousness still exist what is consciousness it is being conscious of something suppose there is nothing no creation is there would consciousness alone be there the answer is yes what is it conscious of it is conscious of its own resonance its own existence and that's what's called the word that's what called the shabd that's what called the nad that's what called the sound current because 
at every descending stage it is still audible we like to say that this method that they say is the royal road to go home camino real the royal road to go home is the attention linking your attention to that sound which is emanating from your true home and changes but continues as one link right up to the physical stage the link can be actually understood better if you see that if you go to sleep and have a dream you have a different body you still know you are the same guy who slept what's the link how do you know that you are the same there's a persistence of the self in every form you take anywhere there was a fahin chinese philosopher he had a dream that he was a butterfly and he was a beautiful butterfly he was flying around and saw such beautiful flowers he had never seen in this world they are so sparkling colors light coming out of those flowers he had never seen them but he saw them in the dream and he woke up and he wondered am i fahin the philosopher who had a dream that he was a butterfly or am i the butterfly who is now having a dream that i am fahin the philosopher because that was more real than this the question is he did not see a butterfly flying he was flying this persistence of the self that the self will always take a form but the self will always know it's the same self that's the power of this audible sound current the power of the word that manifests in the persistence of the same self no matter what your form is no matter if you're formless the self will still be the same so that's the beauty of this that because the self continues to be expressed with the same resonance we can make it into a device for listening so therefore if we listen to what is audible and at the physical stage it's audible like physical sounds the higher you go it changes to sound which it cannot be called sounds you can call resonance it changes higher up with no frequency no resonance is still audible to different kind of ears that we have different kind of reception we have the soul continues to be a listener right up to our true home is still a listener here the soul is not a speaker the soul never speaks the soul has never used any words the mind speaks the soul uses the mind to speak the soul listens the soul uses the mind to speak and listens to what the mind has spoken therefore all speech at the physical plane or astral plane is being done by the mind listening is always done by the soul the mind can't listen it's a very well divided function and yet we don't realize people who listen more and speak less are closer to the spirituality than those who speak more and listen less that is why it's a common advice that you've been given two ears only one tongue so please at least listen twice <laughs> so but the fact that the functions are divided in consciousness within us make it simple that if we listen how do we use the listening capacity to transcend into higher levels of consciousness we do not know where the sound is we are used to sounds outside so we use an external device called repetition of a mantra we say we'll pick up some words or allow a master or a teacher or a guru to pick up some words and call it a mantra or a holy chant and say he has given us these words to repeat and we keep on repeating we don't repeat it because we can't repeat we can only listen we let the mind repeat and the soul listens and that's how the listening starts the listening starts if we don't listen that way then we are constantly listening to sounds outside of ourselves and they distract us and keep us outside if we want to take our attention within then we have to listen to something that is within fortunately the mind thinks its thoughts in words and language inside not outside therefore the thoughts of the mind if we listen carefully 
are also good enough. But the problem with the thoughts is the thoughts have association of ideas with outside things. And when we keep on repeating something which is in my thought stream but connected with something outside, for example, I came to this country, I found Shaky's Pizza. I liked it. Now supposing I say I like Shaky's Pizza, it's a good mantra for me. And I keep on repeating with my eyes closed, Shaky's Pizza, Shaky's Pizza. My mind is not inside, my attention is not inside, it's out in the Shaky's Pizza. Therefore, any words that still have association outside, repetition of those words does not pull our attention inside. On the other hand, if there is something already inside, but not connected with outside, it can help to draw our attention inside. Very often, the mantras that are given by gurus in India, by the masters in India, are words with no connection with anything outside. But they have some connection with events that you might see inside. Therefore, they help. Because uh, the mantra can be anything so long as it is not drawing your attention out. There's a story of a, an American seeker, very keen to get enlightened, and he was told that the real master is sitting in India in the Himalayas, and he can give you a mantra, a powerful mantra. If you repeat that, you get enlightened. And since all Americans like quick, instant action, instant knowledge, he decided to make the trip there. And he went all the way into the Himalayas, waited outside the cave for the master to come out. The master came out of the cave and the seeker said, Master, I believe you give a mantra to people. If they repeat those words, they get enlightened. He said, yes, my child, I do that. Can you give me that mantra? Yes, come near me. I'll give you the mantra. So the seeker approaches the master and the master says in his ear, the mantra is abracadabra. <laughs> He says, what, I've come all the way to hear abracadabra? <laughs> he says, no, there's a catch to it. When you say abracadabra, don't think of bananas. The man tried all his life. The moment he would say abracadabra, bananas would come before him. That's what the master was teaching him, that our words, once we associate them with something outside, they cease to be a good mantra. That the mantra is something that makes us stay and keep our attention inside. That is why, till we can find the real resonance that is surrounding in us, the sound that is coming automatically from levels of consciousness above, till then we can use a repetition of words. Better to use words which have been given by a master, because when he gives those words, in his experience, those words relate to experiences that will come up to us in, later on in meditation. We don't know that yet, because we haven't gone there yet. But the association of ideas holds true for those words, and therefore those words become very useful to start meditation. It's still the method of listening. The soul listens to the words, the mind repeats, and we begin to gather our attention behind the eyes, at the eye center, from where it seems to be operating in our wakeful state. At this state, we are all sitting here, and where are we listening from? Where, where, where are we actually, if we are not the body? If we are not body or senses, or, where are we listening to everything? Where are we watching from? Where are we thinking from? If you contemplate, just spend a little time contemplating, where are we doing this from? It's not from the tips of the fingers, it's not from our feet or legs or hands, it is from the head. And not only any part of the head, left or right, the center. Not any part of the center. Just contemplate, we are doing everything in a wakeful state from behind the eyes. Not only that, there are two eyes. We look out and the eyes, they join the two images to create depth and create three dimensions. And therefore, we are not even seeing with the eyes. Think over it, when we look at things outside, where are we seeing them from? Are we seeing two pictures with two eyes? Of course not. We are merging the two pictures. Where is the actual point of sight? Where is the actual point of thought? Where is the actual point of listening? 
the answer to all those would be it is somewhere between and behind the eyes somewhere in the center of the head that particular point where we are experiencing everything sensory at this time is called the third eye center is called the center of attention is called by different names but it also means that we are as users of attention conscious attention located there then what is what do we do to listen we imagine we are there and listen and your attention will be drawn there this method of withdrawing attention to your own third eye center behind the eyes is the art of good meditation and can take you to any level so long as you keep listening so long as you can withdraw attention to the point behind the eyes you can move up to different levels of experiences so the third eye center is a starting point from that starting point you concentrate the starting point starts moving we don't realize it moves all the time when we go to sleep at night it is no longer behind the eyes it shifts downwards if you have noticed that that when we go to sleep the attention is not flowing from here it's moving down and there's an experiment i tell people to do and they can verify it when you are feeling sleepy at night before going to actual sleep before going to bed you first with your eyes closed touch your eyes with your hand you know where they are you don't have to see your hand close your eyes and you can touch you can know where the eyes are then we are more sleepy touch the eyes again more sleepy we touching the nose and thinking you're touching the eyes if you are still deep and still awake enough to do it you are touching here when you are dreaming if you could touch your physical eyes with your hands in a dream state you will be touching your throat so therefore even the notional point of where you are shifts every day it shifts every night it shifts every morning it shifts it's only in the wakeful state that we are behind the eyes in a higher state it moves behind even that point and further back and up the certain route that it takes and there those are all notional points in the physical body the most surprising thing is that not only all the energy functions of the physical body are located in the six centers of energy centers chakras below us all the higher points are represented by different locations within the head it's amazing that our point of attention is moving within the head and we having experiences which belong to other levels of consciousness and other levels of experience that is why with the help of the perfect living master when we master this art of listening which is called the surt shabd yoga or the yoga of putting your attention on the sound surt means attention shabd means the sound shabd means the eternal sound this sound that is resounding in each one of us right now we don't listen to it because the ears inner ears are turned outwards we only hear things outside the more you will concentrate your attention and when grace comes to you you will find that the sound can be heard constantly 24 hours it's a sound that was never had no beginning has no ending and you just dip into it and start hearing it and that sound is the secret of good meditation when you can hear the sound there are many kinds of sound in the practice of listening to the sound there are many other sounds that come up which are not the same sound that i am talking of for example there is blood vessels going they say that if you put a shell to your ear you can hear the ocean you never hear the ocean you hear the blood circulating in your own ear similarly in meditation we think there are spiritual sounds coming they are physical sounds they are physical sound they resemble the rate of the pulse the pulse can be heard the breathing can be heard their uh, sounds like roaring which are created by the middle ear or by the ear drums those sounds do not have any pull in them they don't attract you you can listen to them but there is nothing to pull you and they don't come automatically you just feel that they are there i call them practice sounds i think there's no harm listening to them just for practice they are not the real sound 
the real sound of consciousness at the physical level rings like a bell tong tong like a big bell that sound of the bell that rings can have a long peal also very long peal in fact the more you listen to it the longer the peal becomes and that sound has a pull in it if you hear that sound you're swept off your feet you don't know where your feet are that's the fastest way to vacate the body and have an inner experience to be able to hear that sound so that sound the initial spiritual sound is the sound of a big bell the same sound transforms when each peal becomes long enough to last forever and doesn't look like a bell because it doesn't have that spikes anymore doesn't have the sign curve in it but become flat but strong then it resounds more like the blowing of a conch or something like that and then that's the next stage of the same sound these two sounds are really emanating from the astral plane and if you just concentrate on them and become unaware of your body you open up into the astral space according to great master this is the simplest method of yoga to be able to listen and go up there is nothing simpler than that so that is why he recommended this as better than standing in the river with one leg or uh, doing uh, upside down yogas and standing headstands and all that stuff instead of doing all that just relax sit in a nice comfortable position close your eyes and listen to the sound and till the sound comes listen to the mantra when the sound comes forget the mantra and go on to the sound if they if there is a little difference sometimes the sound is bored then go back to the mantra sound comes back switch over it works beautifully this practice of the yoga of the sound current has worked the best especially in this age this is the age of the greatest distractions of the human mind there are more distractions today in this world than they ever were before people talk of the uh, golden age and the silver age and the copper age you know in the iron age in those ages life was long we had probably longer life i am not very sure of that but they say so but there were very few distractions and meditation was very difficult initiation was even more difficult finding a perfect living master was a rare event in this age with more distractions the relief is also more the more perfect living masters coming to take us in any area of the planet where we seekers are they they are easier methods to go through and by making the sound a very melodious one that means attractive it makes it easy to practice this if you want to beat the mind to go ahead it's a very difficult job people have tried that i want to beat the mind that uh, i want to meditate on my repetition of mantra the mind start thinking of something else then i beat the mind no more i want to repeat my mantra you start with the mantra the mind start thinking of something else mm-hmm. if nothing else it start thinking how well or how badly you are doing your mantra how fast or slow you are doing it that commentator sits there that commentator is a constant narrator and it distracts you all the time and you beat it and then you again come back to your mantra then the thoughts take you away after an hour of meditation it looks like two and a half hours and it and you get tired and say what a big session why because although you won every battle with the mind you lost the war <laughs> because the mind's intention was to keep you in battle and the mind succeeded on the other hand listening to the sound which has its own melody which is beautiful it's music to the ears and to the spirit it's music to us to be able to listen to that melody is more attractive there's no beating required and gradually even the mind begins to enjoy it the mind is a very strange a uh, strange kind of a computer that we are using inside that if you allow it random movement to randomly think thoughts it most bizarre thoughts it comes up during some of the meditation workshops i do 
I tell people, try to just be behind the eyes and let the mind think randomly. Don't try to think anything. Don't put any thought in your head and see what the mind automatically comes. Most bizarre thoughts, they come up. Unbelievable. And people realize, is this the mind we were relying on all this while? That this is the real nature of the mind? On the other hand, if you tame the mind and it begins to enjoy inner experiences, then the mind will think what you want it to think. And that's called controlling the mind. Otherwise, you can't control thoughts, but you can control the direction in which the mind gets attracted. So the one of the other advantages of the sound is that it is such a melody. It's so, there's so much beauty in that sound. It's not, it's not regular sound. There's no harshness at all in it. It's so soft. And the layers of the sounds coming, one behind the other. And you pick up one, the other one is appearing from behind it. And then one even further behind it. And those layers of music and sounds of different intonations are coming behind. And they look so fine. And they pull you by their attraction. So that is why the meditation by the system of uh, putting attention on the sound has considered the best for these days. I commend it to anybody who is initiated and wants to use it. Use that as a better method. It's worked for me. I'm sure it'll work for anybody who tries it. So this is the method that the Perfect Living Masters are recommending. I would like you to uh, have an experience what it is like to be behind the eyes. Would you like to have it now? How many of you are interested? Oh, very good. Okay, please make yourself comfortable in your chairs. What is meant by being comfortable is that don't relax and go to sleep. <laughs> and don't be so uncomfortable stretching yourself that your attention is in the body and not in, in you. So it's a, it's a medium between the two. So just comfortably relax. Relax in mind. Close your eyes and imagine that the human body is a house in which you are living. And there are several floors of that house, and the sixth floor is behind the eyes, and you are sitting in a room in the sixth floor. Close your eyes. Imagine. It's pure imagination. Imagine you are sitting behind the eyes. Think of nothing else except the space behind the eyes and what you can see. Don't follow anything that you see. What you can hear, don't follow anything. Stay in the center and just relax in the center of the head. No outside thought, only being there. Think of the space around you. Look around you, the dark space around, any colors, any lights going on, any images coming. Don't follow the images. Look at them from a distance. Stay in the center. Don't go too forward close to the eyes. Go backwards to the center. Push your feet and go back. Remain in the center. Whatever images are coming in front, let them pass. Don't follow them. Concentrate on being in the center. No other thoughts, only being in the head. Look around what is around there, not anywhere outside. Ignore the patterns and colors in front of you. Let them pass. Stay in the center. Any sounds come, ignore them. Don't follow them. Listen to them from the center. 
डोंट मूव साइडवेज Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Welcome back to the outside world. How many of you enjoyed this short exercise? That's because that's the starting point. That the starting point. That's where your journey starts. all meditation should be practiced at that point people have special chairs in their houses this is my meditation chair they have cushions special cushions for meditating special corners in the house i look at them i appreciate that they are interested in meditation but then i realize that wouldn't the attention go into the chair wouldn't the attention be captured by the cushions Won't the attention be captured by the corner of the room? Won't they be conscious of that while they are meditating? You should forget everything. You are not in any room. You are in this room, in the head. Starting point is that you are in the room on top of your head. That's where you meditate, and that's very important to make success of meditation. Starting point should be inside the head. I thought I'll just give you a little experience of this so that. you know there's a big difference in being there and then starting even your repetition of mantra listening to the sound or any other meditation that you want to do be there and you'll have success in meditation it is customary for me to go into these meetings with a promise from the master to give you some astral gifts not physical gifts astral gifts the procedure is simple that we place the gifts on top of the room of this hall they are not real they are imaginary but all imagination is coming from the astral plane anyway i have had this experience in large number of meetings where people have picked up those gifts and still remember them are there any people here who have done that yes there are 1 2 3 Four, three, four people are sitting here who had a still uh, gifts picked up from the roof. I want for those of you who are interested and would like to have the experience of picking up an astral gift from top of this roof to get a chance at it. How many of you would be interested? Good, sufficient number of volunteers. Okay, the process is simple. That I will once again ask you to close your eyes. and imagine that you have left your chair and gone upstairs you can fly you can go from outside you can go by a ladder you can imagine anything it's imaginary that you have left walked away and you have gone up to the roof and there you have to see if there's a package waiting for you if you find a package you pick it up you can bring it down and open it or you can open it right there and see what is in the package and if you find a package and you get something it will be an astral gift from the great master and if you uh, get one of the good gifts i will recommend that you keep it for a long time it will be very useful i have seen that happen before so now just to give you an example of how the imaginary body which is the same as astral body we we make a big issue of what is the astral body imagination arises from the astral plane and when we say astral body it's merely the imaginary body which looks unreal because our reality is fixed in the physical world if our attention were to go into that imaginary body that will become more real and this body sitting here will become imaginary it's just a simple shift of how much of attention is in one or the other just to demonstrate you people sitting there can you imagine that you are walking up here as shaking my head let's try you just imagine that you are leaving your chairs walking up and shaking my hand here see how many of you can do it how many of you successfully shook my hand wow good number 
that's the same way the same body that came and shook my hand will go up to the roof and pick up the uh, gift if you have one package for you it, it's normally a package that is packed up and you open it okay close your eyes those interested in the gift please close your eyes imagine you are got up from your chairs you are going up to the roof you can fly through you can go from outside anyway go on top of the roof and see if there is any package that you find Take your time. No hurry. Now collect your package. Come down. Time to come back. Open the packages. See what you have. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Welcome back. How many of you were able to get packages? Wow, very good. Very good. Did anybody get a surprise? What did you get? Very good. I'm happy. Anybody else want to describe any extraordinary experience? Very good. Good experience. People have had experiences of things changing. Uh, sometimes when we have a meditation session or when some of you join, you'll have experiences to show that the est that the sensory system that we are employing here all belong to the astral plane that in a state of imagination which becomes a reality in the astral plane you have more experiences of the senses than you can have in the physical plane so and it's not as imaginary as we think it is because we think it's imaginary because our reality is fixed in the physical and that's why it's all imaginary but when the reality is both are be created by the same consciousness and when we are able to move the consciousness up that we find the so called imagination was not as imaginary as we thought anyway i'm glad that some of you had this good experience and that you got uh, uh, something that you can save and uh, something that the meaning of which sometime you may not know immediately but know later on that also happens it depends on the gift that you get it's like this that the world is getting darker and the spots that were lighted are getting lighter that means the general world is getting darker but the spots that were enlightened are getting more light more spots have come up with light in the darkness that's one way of looking at it the second way is that if you have a dark room and a very little light you can't see all the dirt in that room because the light is not enough you put a high candescent light there all the dirt shows up and we think it's worse than it was actually there's more light there for we can see more so what has happened is there was evil in this world all the time but there's not enough light not enough enlightened people to see it and now we can see a little more there was no media like that there was no electronics like we have today so these all this new developments have shown up things which could not be seen before crime is immediately reported accidents are immediately reported things that are dark are now known much faster than they were known before so it is not that only darkness has increased the darkness and the light have both increased at the same time no many images we see in meditation sometimes even without meditation of faces that we saw in previous lives we don't recognize them now but they're all uh, faces with which we had connection in past lives and they come up before us they come up in meditation also and that's why i was saying don't follow any images let them pass like a tv screen let them pass and don't follow them okay they come up very often in meditation how many uh, of you saw images floating around when you were doing meditation there you have more people who had the same experience okay yes that at a certain stage you will find no difference between hearing and seeing because right now in the physical world 
our senses are completely separated. But as we go up, the senses get combined. In the causal plane, all senses function as one sense. Hearing, you can see sounds visually and you can hear images as you go up. That's common. And I might mention to you that when I said to him, it'll take six months for me to give an answer, I could have given him the answer the same minute. Why did I choose to wait six months to satisfy his mind? The mind believes that it takes time to get answers, particularly his mind. <laughs> he wrote it from the Akashic Records. <laughs> All the great inspirations that have come to all artists come from the astral plane. That is why great poetry has been written by poets without knowing where it's coming from. Great music has been written and composed without knowing where it's coming from. Great art has been created without knowing where it's coming from. It's all coming from the astral plane. You mean my biography, where I was born and all that? <laughs> I was born in India, in a town. <laughs> it's a big place. I was <laughs> Before I was born, <laughs> my mother had a dream when she was five months pregnant. She had a dream that in the house there was a fireplace, and on top of the fireplace where we call a mantel piece, there was a little plastic doll. In those days, they used to sell those plastic dolls, pink-colored plastic dolls, not the one with clothes and all that, just the uh, pink-colored. I don't know if some of you old-timers might have seen those dolls. And she saw in the dream a doll there. And then, while she was watching the doll, the doll began to move and began to shake. And then the doll became a little baby. And the baby raised its hand and began to give a discourse. <laughs> she couldn't understand the dream. So she went to great master. And she said, I had this funny dream that I saw a doll. The doll began to quiver and shake. And then it became a live baby. And the baby, little baby sitting on the mantelpiece began to give me a discourse. He said, that's a son that's coming to you that will be born and he will give discourses. That's how he described before I was born. My father and my mother both were disciples of the great master before I was born. My father became a disciple when he was a student and he was a student of philosophy and metaphysics. And he always had this question about free will, about reality, about levels of reality and things like that. And his professors could not answer those. Somebody recommended go to a village near the river Bias, and a man with a white beard will give you the answer. So he went there, he met great master who gave him the answers. He went back to college and told his professors, I got the answers from another professor. Uh, his name is Baba Savan Singh. And he sits on the bank of the river, and he gives all the answers. So many of the professors became disciples of the great master. <laughs> then my father said to, uh, to my mother, when the little child is born, because now great master has said that he will be giving discourses, we should take him to great master as soon as he, he is born. The expected date of birth was somewhere in the end of November. And he said the good time to take him to the Dera, to, to the great master, would be the big day. Big day meant Christmas Day, 25th of December. My grandmother, my father's mother, said you cannot take a child outside the house for 40 days after childbirth. So forget about the Christmas Day. I was born on 26th of November at 10 o'clock in the morning. And my father insisted that I'm going to take this child mm -hmm. to the Dera. They said, no, no, he's too small, and uh, he'll get hurt on the way. There are no proper roads there, things like that. The grandmother protested on grounds of 
their superstition that if you take a child out for 40 days, he'll have a very bad life. It didn't turn out to be right, of course. And my father insisted, and on the 25th of December, 1926, I was taken to the Dera, where the great master looked at me. And he put his hand on my cheek and did like this. And he said, do you remember me? That's the beginning of my life. The end, end is I am sitting here today after 85 years of this event. <laughs> At age nine and a half, on the 9th of uh, March, 1936, my grandfather, who became a satsangi after my father, then everybody in the family became a disciple of great master. My grandfather decided to take me to great master for half initiation. Great master used to give half initiation to children of 10 and below. And half initiation consisted of just listening to the sound. He taught them how to listen to the sound. So it was a very simple exercise. And I was about nine and a half at that time in March of 1937. When I went there, the great master said, Sir Lekraj Puri's son, Ishwar, the great master said, I know him. I've known him from childhood. So what have you brought him for? He said, he wants Nam. This means initiation. And I brought him for half initiation to you. So great master caught me by the arm. I stood in front of him. He caught me by the arm. And he said, what kind of initiation do you want? Sweet or salted? <laughs> so I knew, I had seen that that many kids went before him and he would ask them the same question. What kind of naam do you want? What kind of initiation do you want? Sweet or salted? And everybody said sweet. And he had a box of candies next to him. He would give the candy and they would run away. So I thought he's going to do the same thing with me. But I, I said, no, 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 no sweet or salt. I want this one. Yeah. So he laughed. He didn't say if I'm going to be initiated or not. He just kept a hold of my arm and made me sit next to him while he was doing the selection of other candidates for initiation. He asked simple questions from them. Have you stopped drinking? You don't take alcohol? You don't take meat? And how long have you been like this? So on those simple questions, he would decide, okay, you are ready. Others, you are not ready yet. This was called the selection process. Chanti, they call it. Chanti or selection. So the selection was going on and I thought that I have been dismissed with sweet and salt and I should now go because I was playing somewhere when my grandfather picked me up. But the great master's hold was very strong on my arm. I couldn't escape. So at the end of the chanti, at the end of selection, he got up from the platform where he was sitting. He got up and he said, come with me. I'll give you full initiation and you will sit in front of me. So I went inside, very alert. Today I tell you a secret. I felt more mature as a human being at that age than I feel today. I think I've grown in reverse. <laughs> I've become more childish today than I was then. <laughs> so he took me inside, made me sit in front, and I remember every word as if it is happening this morning. And he said, what I'm going to give you, I got from my master. Baba Jamal Singh, it has worked for me. I hope it will work for you. If you find something better, take it. Don't come back to me for my permission. I give you permission in advance. If anybody gives you an initiation better than what I'm giving you, take it. But do me one favor, that after you take it, come back to me and tell me, so I will also go and take it. These are great master's words. I took them very seriously. I've been searching for something better ever since. If today I find something better, I'll take it. And I'll go and tell GM, great master, I found something better. I haven't. Not till today. These are the opening days of my life. I was a great skeptic. After that, I became a bigger skeptic because of one strange reason. That there was an attorney in the Dera, Bhagat Singh was his name. 
He was the attorney that was helping great master in his legal matters. And his son was 11 years old when he got initiated. They used to call him Nicky as a pet, pet name. They called him Nicky. When I went home and I told my parents I had been initiated with full initiation, my father was very happy. So was my mother. My father was overjoyed that you have got special grace from the great master. And then some friends, satsangi friends came to visit us. And they, my father out of his joys told them, my son got initiated, full initiation today by great master. And they said, oh, oh, oh that's so sad. Satsangi said that. You know, to get a young child at that age initiated is unfair because he doesn't understand anything. When he grows up and he finds that this was just something imposed on him and he had never been given a choice to select the spiritual path for himself, he'll regret it and run away from the path. Look at the case of Nikki, Bhagat Singh's son. He was initiated at the age of 11 and he grew up and has gone totally against the master, against the path, and he thinks it was just a hoax played on him. Your boy can do the same thing. While they were saying this to my father, I was overhearing, eavesdropping from the next room. And a thought came to me immediately. Why would I wait and grow up and then come to know that I'm playing a hoax or it's real? I should start investigating now. And for about eight or nine years while I went to college and all, I was still a skeptic and tried everything else to find if there was something better. And I said, it's according to the master's instructions. Go and find something better. So I went through all that phase of uh, being a doubter, a skeptic, angry. I used to get angry at the way religion was treating people. I was angry at the history of religion. And I was disappointed over so many things. It took me a lot of time to overcome that. And then with Great Master's grace only, the things began to turn in the late, uh, in the uh, in, in 40s. I did ask him some questions, but it was in 1942 that I asked him the last question. Then I was satisfied after that. So I, some experiences proved that it is not... It is not uh, make-believe or it's not a hoax. It's a genuine path to enlightenment. It's a genuine path that takes you to different higher level of consciousness. It gives you all the answers about creation. It gives you all the answers about yourself. It gives you all the answers about life. What else could one ask for? Got all the answers. And then what happens? The spiritual progress is not measured merely by what you see inside in meditation. It's measured in the changes in your life that take place. Your anger becomes less. Your ego becomes less. Your lust becomes less. Possessiveness and greed becomes less. And you can notice those things. Eventually, none of these affect you. And you still have a great time living in the same world in which everybody else is living. And you have a, a life that is automatically running smoothly for you. You don't make decisions. You let your master make decisions. You don't make mistakes. You let your master make mistakes. And so on. So you let the whole uh, credit and blame go to master. It's a different kind of lifestyle. And yet nobody can know what's happening to you internally. Because after that I was doing different kind of jobs. I joined the government and I rose to be chief secretary of a state. I had 50,000 people whose reports through various layers would come to me, through the directors and secretaries. Nobody knew I was even initiated. Nobody knew what I was practicing. And I didn't know how I did my job. I was not qualified. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew somebody was doing it. So life changes. When you have a perfect living master with you, life totally changes. So I am a product of that kind of life, I'm tested out. I am not uh, believing anything without having tested it out. That's why I tell everybody, don't accept anything. In one of the verses of one of the mystics, he says that you should not even believe the word of your master unless you 
have tested and seen it yourself. That this is not a path of blind faith at all. It's not that because he said so, therefore I believe it. It's not that kind of thing. You have to experience it. But that puts a big responsibility on the seeker, on the disciple, that to test it, he must do what the master tells him to do, to meditate. And the mind somehow does not let you meditate. It says, well, tomorrow I'll start. Okay, that tomorrow never comes. Okay, today I've done enough. Must be an hour. No, it says 10 minutes only. <laughs> okay, I'll make it 15 minutes tomorrow. I mean, look at the way the mind has all these excuses. And yet with all the mind's excuses and delayed, all these tactics, we still have to go through. And if you are able to go through, the results are amazing. and changes your life completely. I won't tell you all the other stories. <laughs> Is there any other? Yes. What was the last question she said? It was about personal experiences inside. I have uh, normally not shared any of those experiences except what uh, the master permits me to share. I don't do today, I don't do anything outside of what I think is his will. And whatever, whatever his direction, given on a daily basis or a moment-to-moment -moment basis. It's a, it's a very simple life. I don't take decisions. I let the master do it. Or whoever is talking to me about, say, oh, what do you think? You want this? I say, what do you think? That's a good answer, isn't it? <laughs> Will you take this or that? What do you say? How about this? Yes. Life becomes simple. The fewer the choices, the simpler the life. And you find the simpler the life, the happier you are. <laughs> when you make it too complex and too complicated, it does not add to happiness. Simplicity creates happiness. But the greatest happiness is in having a friend with you all the time. There's nothing like that. That you can talk to somebody who is with you and is present in the same way like your physical presence of people. The, the presence of the radiant form of a master is not an imaginary thing that the master is there. It's exactly like physical presence of a master. Sometimes I get surprised. I was in Hawaii and uh, some people wanted me, some satsangis wanted me to see the top of a hill there and to say that one day there will be a satsangar there or a place of worship there. And they said, will you come up? I had a rental car. When I was driving up the hill, they were waiting upstairs, up on the hill. And I was driving my car and I felt that the great master was sitting next to me. I would see from the corner of my eye that he was there. I saw his white beard, I saw his turban, cream jacket, everything that I used to see, I could see. It's an amazing experience, but I have had that experience it's physically present in the car. So I drove up and I landed, and those people opened the door and immediately said, Great Master is here. I didn't tell them I was seeing them. They also saw in the same place. So these things have happened. Once I was in an elevator in Hong Kong, a man fell on his ground. I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm just seeing the man with the white beard here. So these are experiences which come when they come again and again, and then they become part of your life. And then life is wonderful. There was a doctor, Dr. Isha Singh, a veterinary doctor. His life was an amazing life. And he wanted to tell me that we do not recognize our master even after initiation. We do not recognize our master even when we have made spiritual progress. We do not know who the master is even after we see his radiant form. He's always more than what we see. And as you go and see more and more, he's still more and more than that. It's an amazing. He said we, didn't, we don't recognize him. Even after knowing he's a perfect master, we still don't recognize. And he, that doctor used to say, a master is a friend first and master next. Not that he's master first and then become a friend. He becomes a friend first and then he's a master. That means 
It's an unconditional friendship that you find in a master. No conditions, all love, unconditional love. It's very hard to get that from people in the world. And yet there are people, perfect living masters, who show that all the time. It's amazing. Dr. Ishwar Singh was the man who lived about 15 miles away from the Dera. Uh, and he was told by two of his neighbors who were Muslims, but they were disciples of great master. They told him that since you are always searching for the truth and the master, the man lives on the bank of the river, Bias, three miles downstream from the main road, from the highway. If you go there one day, you'll be able to see him. So one day, this doctor, veterinary doctor, animal doctor, he took his bicycle and he took the bike and went three miles down along the river. And there was no master and no ashram, and no dera. And he went on and on. He went nine miles. There was no dera, no ashram. It got very late at night. He had started after work. And then at the end, after about nine or 12 miles, it got dark. And he saw a ferry station, a ferry that was crossing people on the river, Bias. So he asked the ferryman, I have been wandering to look for the dera and the master. He said, you are on the wrong side of the river. <laughs> he is only three miles downstream from the other side. You come to the wrong side. He said, then can you take me in your ferry? He says, it's too dark now. Moreover, there's only a small village on the other side. And there's no road to take you. You can't even take your bike to go upstream now. So you better wait here and go in the morning. He said, no, I have to go right now. I must meet the master. I have heard from my neighbors. He's a perfect master. So he insisted. And the ferryman said, I'll take you at your own risk. Took him on his boat in the ferry, dropped him on the other side. Isha Singh told me the story, how hard it was. There was no road. He, in fact, there was no pathway even to drag his bicycle. So he had to carry the bicycle on his head. He was, a bit, he was hurt by thorns and bushes and so on. But all night he would waver away. Then he would come near the river. And early morning, about 4 o'clock or 4.30, he arrived and saw the little hut. Their great master used to come on weekends. He was still working in the military engineering service, and he used to come on weekends for satsang. And when he went there, he knocked on the door. There were just two little huts there. He knocked on the door, and the old lady came out and began to abuse him and shout at him and said, you people have no respect for a master. Is this the time to come and disturb him? And she used vulgar language, and she cursed him. And he had heard that there was a bibi, a lady, who had been with Swamiji in Agra, who had come with Baba Jabal Singh, and now was with the great master. Her name was Bibi Rukko. And that Bibi Rukko uh, was a very advanced lady. And when he saw this, he said, what kind of advancement is this? <laughs> I've never seen a more angry woman than this. So he got thoroughly disappointed and went back to Kapoorthala, to his home. And next morning he told his uh, neighbors, you were wrong that master couldn't be a real master because a woman came out there. First of all, I spent all night traveling and then I reached in the morning and that angry woman came out and used such bad language. How can a master be real when the woman who is living near him all the time can be so angry and so mad? They laughed. They said, master played a trick on you. <laughs> he said, what kind of trick did he play? His trick was, you went to see the master. Did you see him? No, you saw the woman and came back. That's the trick. The master made sure if you want to see the master, go and see the master, don't come back without just by seeing a woman there. He said, next time you will see the woman will be the most pious and holy woman you'll see. <laughs> Same woman will be very different. So that's why we know that these perfect living masters, they have a great sense of humor. <laughs> and they play jokes and they play games with us. Because for them, everything is a game. So <laughs> he said, okay, next time I'm going to really go in time and not be disturbed by any woman. So next time he went in the daylight on one of the weekends, he told his, uh, his friend, because he was an animal doctor, he used to treat the horses and animals of the Maharaja. Maharaja meant the ruler of the state. 
in which he lived, as well as uh, other people. There was a chief who owned all the land around the Dera. And that chief had horses, and this doctor used to treat those horses and take care of them. So he said to the chief, Chief, let's go one day and go to the Dera. He said, what? You with that hut there? He said, yes, it's all your land. He says, I'll never go there. Why, chief? He says, I understand whoever goes there never comes back. <laughs> I am not going to go there. He said, chief, it's your land. We should both go together on our horses. And the, the master's there on weekends. In the evening at 5 o'clock, he gives a discourse. And the next day, he gives a discourse. Let's go and hear this 5 o'clock discourse. The chief said, you can go. I don't want to go. He said, let's go together. You stay at a distance. And from a distance, we'll see him. So they, then the chief agreed. Then they both went, and they tied their horses. And great master was already giving a discourse at that time. There were 20 people sitting in front of him. The sambat was very small. The 20 people sitting in front of him. And they stood at a distance, these two. And great master was reading from a book in his hand. He closed the book and looked at them and called them like this. He gave a sign, come. In India, when you call somebody, you do like this. In America, you do like this. I found out later. <clears throat> the great master gave an indication, you come near. And uh, he said, chief, they are calling us. He's calling us. Chief said, he's not calling me, he's calling you. <laughs> if he were calling me, they said, let's see who's calling. So they let us separate. So chief went on one direction, and Ishar saying doctor went on the other side. And the great master looked. The two have now separated. He looked at Ishar Singh and called him. So he went forward, and he sat on the back of those 20 people. Then great master opened the book and he saw that he was sitting behind. He closed the book again and he said, come, sit in front. So he made him sit right in front of him. And then he opened the book and began to read from the book and interpret what it was. Isha Singh got all the answers to his questions which had been accumulating in his head for years. He was so happy that the whole thing is in the little book he's holding in his hand. He said, the book is the secret. Now we know why he's called a great master. He has the book. So at the end of the discourse, he got up. He said, Master, can I beg a favor of you? Can I have that book of yours? Great master said, sorry, I can't give you that book. He said, sir, can you give me for a week? After you come next week, I'll bring the book back. I'll study for a week and bring it back. He says, no, sometimes in the middle of the week, I need to study the book. He said, Master, can you give me the book for tonight? I'll sit outside your hut and read it at night and give you back in the morning. Great Master said, I'm sorry, I sometimes get up in the middle of the night to read the book. <laughs> he said, Master, I've got 75 rupees in my pocket. I'll give you the whole 75 rupees for that book. He said, even if you give me a million rupees, I won't give you the book. His suspicion was absolutely confirmed. The whole secret is the book. <laughs> When he went and told those people, they said, the book is available for two rupees everywhere. <laughs> it, the book was Sarbachan. <laughs> it is a simple book, sold everywhere for two rupees. <laughs> and great master played that game again on him. <laughs> Ishra Singh told me that had he given me that book that day, I would never have gone back to him. I would have been reading the book all my life. And he, he kept me from that. So then when the... His neighbors told him, no, that was just a trick, to not to get you kept on the book, but to see a real master. He's a real master. Go and get initiated. So he says he went again in the daytime, and he saw a great master sitting outside on a chair outside the hut, and he folded his hands. He says, Master, I've come again. I want to be initiated. And great master said, have you broken your arm? He said, is that a requirement? <laughs> oh, he, says, he says, no, it's not a requirement. It just happens that in your case, you will get initiated after you break your arm, get a fracture, get it healed, and come back to me. He says, but master, why would I get a fracture? He said, don't you ride horses? 
He says, yes, I ride horses. I have never fallen from a horse. He says, sometimes, you know, one can fall from a horse and get fractured. He said, Master, why should I be fractured? <laughs> okay, then you go. To come back when you are healed in your arm. I'll give you initiation. I promise I'll give you initiation after your arm is healed. He went back to Kapoorthara. His wife was very angry. Wife's name was Maya. Maya said, where have you been all day? The Maharaja, the ruler of the state, has been calling you all day. He sent five messages. Have you been out all day? He thought some animal must have been sick or something. So the ruler is calling him to the palace. And he rushed there to the palace. And the Maharaja was sitting on his throne and saying, where were you, doctor? All day I called for you five times. He said, I had gone to see one Maharaji. That's how he dressed. Master. He said, what Maharaji? There's no Maharaji. I am the Maharaja. I am the ruler. He said, no, that's a holy man. And I had to go out to see him. He said, you are an intelligent person, a doctor. You believe in this holy man, superstitious man. Don't go after them. And I'll tell you why I called you. Only this morning, I have received two new horses, two new steeds from Arabia, Saudi Arabia. And I have held up the inauguration of riding on them. I said, I will ride on one and my doctor will ride on the other. So they are ready, both horses, and we have to go riding. Doctor said, excuse me, I will not ride. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you have been riding with me, you have been riding horses all your life, what's happened to you? That Maharaji has told me not to ride, I'll break my arm. He says, you are such a superstitious man. I have told you that we will only do the inauguration. Okay, I'll tell you, to save my face, you just get on to a horse. I'll also get on, I'll ride away, and you can get down. He agreed with that. As soon as he put his foot in the stirrup and got the horse shot off, and he fell, the horse was a new one, not knowing the terrain. Horse fell, he fell underneath, had a multiple fracture on the right arm the same day. He said, I knew this will happen. <laughs> <laughs> now I know he's a perfect living master <laughs> because he predicted correctly. So he said, okay, then he had multiple fracture and he got uh, um, the, what these, what do they, have they call them, the fixed? Cast? Yeah. yeah. He put the cast and all, but then Plastic. arm got, huh? it can't move then. Calcification. Calcification. He got calcification, his, his shoulder was hurt, and he got calcification, he couldn't move the arm too much. After the six weeks, the plaster was removed, and he went back. Master, I broke my arm, I have healed, and uh, I have come to you for initiation. Great Master said, raise your right hand to your right ear. He said, Master, I can't do that. He said, sorry, then I can't initiate you. He says, well, every time you put a new condition on me, <laughs> Every time I come to you, you add a new condition. He said, no, it's not a new condition. I told you last time, break your arm and get healed. And then I will give you. You haven't healed. He says, Master, this cannot be healed. It's calcification. It's all solid. He says, when your horses break their legs, what do you do? You shoot them, you cure them. He said, I can cure them. But there's a very strong acid that dissolves the calcification. And the ho it's such a painful process. The horse hits the ground and makes a hole in the ground. It's so bad. He says, why don't you try this? <laughs> he says, Master, it's too bad for a human being. I can't survive. He says, you dilute the acid, the turpentine oil. Okay, and then use it. So he went. He said it was a painful process, but with diluted acid, ultimately calcification went away, and he was able to put his hands up. He went, he got initiated. Now, these kind of stories are only stories today. We don't hear such events today. But the next event I'm going to tell you is even more rare and not to be followed. And that was, he was so happy with the initiation. He made such good progress. He said, I would like my dad also to get initiated. <laughs> he said, that's the best thing I can do for my dad to take him to great master. Now, dad was a very orthodox Sikh. That means he believed only in the Sikh book, the scriptures, as the final guru. There's no guru. No human being can be a guru. He didn't believe in that. 
So he tried to persuade him, that's a very holy man, you come. He said, no, I don't believe in these holy men. The father would not agree. So ultimately, he tried every possible way to persuade the father. One day, great master was leaving for another town and was going to the railroad station. And uh, he, he just came and said, Master, you're going to the railroad station. Can we play a little trick on my dad? He says, what trick? He says, I'll bring him to the station saying, I have some work with the station master, the station superintendent. And while he's there and you are waiting for your train, will you give him your darshan and see him? Master said, certainly, bring him. So the plan was made. And on the day the great master was leaving, was at the railroad station. And Isha Singh went and told his dad, Dad, I have to go up to the station. I have some work with the station superintendent. Would you like to come along? OK, I'll come along. They both took their horses and they went to the station. He said, Dad, hold my reins of my horse. I'll just go to the station superintendent and come back. The platform in the uh, Bias station is at a lower level. And the waiting is at an upper level. So he ran down. A great master was waiting for the train on the platform. He said, Master, I brought my dad. He's up there holding the horses. And can you run up and give him darshan? He said, yes, yes, I will. And now see the scene that I come to mind. Both running up. Great master running and the doctor running. But by the time they ran up, the dad suspected something was wrong and he left. He had already gone away. He never had the chance to see the great master. So he failed again. When he failed so many times, he said, I must try something more fail, fail proof. What he did early morning when dad was sleeping, he took a long rope and swung around the bed and tied him up. <laughs> now, those are not big, those are cots, uh, just made of bamboo cots. And so it was not very heavy. So he tied him up, and the dad woke up and said, what are you doing? Why are you tying me up like this? He said, Dad, I'm taking you to the master. <laughs> <laughs> what? Do you think that you can tie me up and take to a master and I'll accept him? How is that possible? Then he had already arranged for a horse cart to come. And he took the bed out with the father and put it on the cart. The father was screaming. My son has gone mad. My son has gone mad. All the neighbors came out of their houses. They said, doctor, what's happened? He says, my father's got crazy, and I'm taking him to mental hospital. <laughs> he said, no, I'm not crazy. My son has got mad. And every, all the neighbors said, take him quickly. <laughs> so there they can imagine a horse cart with his father on a bed tied up with ropes going to the dera to see the master. <clears throat> that scene, and he's screaming on the way. Reaches there, master was sitting outside on a chair outside the hut, and he saw this scene, a man tied up, screaming, <laughs> and the Easter thing on his horse next to it. He got up, he said, what is this going on? And when they came close, he said, Easter thing, what is this going on? He said, I brought my dad for initiation. <laughs> <laughs> he said, is this the way to treat your father? Have you no sense left in you? Are you mad? And the dad said, that's what I have been telling him. <laughs> He's mad. He's the great master said, take the uh, gentleman off from that, uh, take off the ropes and go and put some balm on his injuries. He has injured himself trying to struggle. Take him inside. So the sevadars took him inside the hut. And Isha Singh said, this is going to be a hard case for me. <laughs> great master came out like this. He says, now you go away for three days come back after three days. And Isha Singh said, three days, three months, three years is not enough for my dad. <laughs> so what will happen in three days? Anyway, he went away. After three days, he comes, and his horse happened to dirty that place, the shit on the, near the place. And he saw his father standing like this near the great master. And the father took off his shirt to clean up the place, which the horse had dirtied, and said, you were always mad. Don't you realize before a perfect master, you're dirtying the place? He said, is that you, dad? <laughs> he said, you have no idea. You never told me who he is. He, it has been such a wonderful experience. 
Only this morning he initiated me. I am so blessed. This is a story of how Isha Singh's dad was initiated. Not to be repeated again. <laughs> Not to be used by anybody. Those were strange days when this could be done. So this is how that man was. And he kept on saying till the end of his life that he is a friend first. A master is a friend first. Master next. Don't think, don't put him on a pedestal and say, oh, there is a teacher teaching us these things. Thousands of teachers are teaching those things. Oh, there are teachings only he can tell. No, thousands of books have been written containing the same teachings. The books and the teachers are in abundance. Perfect living master is a rare thing. And those perfect living masters are the ones who become our friends and who can take us back home to our true home. Thank you very much.